Daphne. Since beginning the project in October 2019, her marvelous visual research on ayas and ammas can be found on Instagram ayas home. Farhana has played a key role in tracking down the ayas home in Hackney and reviving the stories of the forgotten ayas as well as restoring their voices, agency, courage and most of all their dignity. Farhana's talk today is about the blue plaque. Very well. Thank you. Um, uh, can I hear me? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, I want to say just very quickly thank you all so much for coming. Um, as Amiti mentioned, the last event we had here at Hackney Museum was about Ayers Home, and I got very emotional, so I promise I'm, I'm not going to get emotional today. Um, we just had the amazing <laughs> ceremony at 26 Kilometers Road, which is just down the street, so if you did miss the unveiling that you'd like to see the blue plaque, I do really recommend you go and see it. It's fantastic to see it in person. Um, I get asked quite a lot about what this blue plaque means to me and why I applied for the blue plaque. And the simple answer really is why not? Um, for those of you who don't know, the blue plaque scheme is completely from public um, applications. They don't go after the kind of history themselves. It really is up to the public. So it's really, really important everyone here to really make sure they know what goes on with the process. Um, there are a couple of criteria that are really important when it comes to applying for the blue plaque and one of them is to make sure that the home or the building looks the same or similar to the time that you're applying for the blue plaque for. Um, and that was something really considerable and remarkable actually with the eyes in itself given how much gentrification um, is happening in East London, it's incredible that the building still exists exactly as it does in the photographs. Um, and you can see some of those photographs in Niti's incredible <coughs> exhibition there, and um, I really highly, highly recommend you do have a quick look. It's incredible the information she's put together. Um, these women, which Rosina and Florian will, will delve into a bit more with their incredible research, um, but these women were presented so differently to how they actually are or how they actually were. In so many of the photographs and paintings that we, that we see of Ayers, they are made to look much smaller than they really, are, really were. Um, their stories are absolutely remarkable. Like Shannon said, we have worked really hard to make sure that, that we share the dignity of these women. Um, these women could have been related to me, they could have been my ancestors, they could have been any one of our ancestors or caregivers or any of the families that, who existed. They are marginalised constantly throughout history um, and it's really up to us to make sure that their stories are brought to life. Um, I hope that many of you who will see the Blue Plaque will be inspired to look at your own local histories, to look at hidden histories that we're never taught. Um, and to bring that to light for future generations because it is really important. Um, something Florian always mentions, which I think is a really great point, so I'm just going to see it from him for a moment, um, <laughs> is that we constantly think about the Ayers and immediately kind of pigeonhole them as Asian history or British Asian, Asian history. Um, by doing that, we do an incredible disservice. They are an integral part of British history, of international history. Um, just look around the room and see how many people um, find the stories of the eyes really resonate with them and we come from so many corners of the world um, just like they did and just like they carry on doing. Um, something that Shalini's research definitely touches on as well is how these stories of the eyes they aren't tied to history, they are a very contemporary issue. They might not be called eyes anymore, but the patterns still exist. The behaviours towards these women still exist, um, and that is something incredibly important as well for this blue plaque, is that the stories resonate throughout history, throughout our histories that we currently live in, um, and it's up to us to make sure that, that we give them a voice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it is a real honor for me to introduce Rosina Vistram, who actually needs no introduction at all. <laughs> She's a distinguished historian and educationalist. Her major publications include Ayas, Laskers, and Princes. Actually, I've got her book from the LSE Library. Here we are. Mm. <laughs> 
uh, Indians in Britain, 1700 to 1947, Pluto, 1986, Press and Routledge, 2016. And Asians in Britain, 400 years of history, that's your Pluto, 2002. Uh, Rosina was advisor to the major project Making Britain from 2007 to 2010. In 2006, Rosina was awarded an honorary doctorate by the Open University. More than anything, Rosina is the pioneer of IR studies in the UK and it is because of her passion and her inspiring and painstaking work that we're here today. So a very warm welcome and thank you. Right, I hope everybody can hear me. I'm no good at using these things. Because <laughs> I was a teacher and I always thought I had a voice for a teacher which goes at the back of the class. <laughs> Right, in the autumn of 1993, when I began my research into Asian migration to Britain from the 17th century, I must admit I knew precious little. I knew about one man, Dada by Noroji, Indian soldiers as an Imperial Fire Brigade in colonial wars of conquest, and a little bit about Indian sailors as part of the maritime labor force. As for the ayahs, I had come, come across a few intriguing references to Asian domestics in British households in the novels of Dickens and Thackeray. For instance, in David Copperfield, we come across Julia Mills, returning from India, steeped in money and with a black man to carry cards and letters on a golden salver, and copper-colored women in linen with a bright handkerchief round her head to serve her tiffin in her dressing room. Mm -hmm. As for the available academic studies, these focused on the post-war migration of Indians, Pakistanis, and Bangladeshis. So I had to start my research in archives to locate available primary sources. How and where was I to begin? What I intend doing in this talk is briefly described my process of research and some of the references that I came across in parish registers, East India Company records, contemporary writings, newspapers, official records in national and local archives, and in painting, as you can see, a lot of sources. All this helped me build up a picture of ayahs brought over to Britain by British families and my discovery of Ayas home in Hackney. Just a few examples. Of the several paintings depicting Ayas, I will mention two. The children of Edmund Holden Cuttenden with an Ayah painted by Joshua Reynolds. In 1759-62, I think this is the earliest painting. And another dated 1893, at the height of Victorian imperialism by George Earl going north King Cross Station has a little girl clinging to her ayah. The protective relationship and the child's trust in an ayah comes over graphically. References to Indian servers abound in literature of the period. Warren Hastings and his wife return with two Indian boys and four maids. The four ayahs were sent back for refusing to work any harder than in India. In a letter to Fanny Burney in 1789, Mrs. Locke described the arrival in Godalming, Surrey, of several postcases containing British families with their Indian servants, nurses, and children. The Reverend Francis Kilbert, in his diary, mentions Jemima, a Catholic ayah brought over twice by his sister Emmy and husband Sam. The ayah is described as devotedly fond of children. The ayah ate with other servants in the kitchen and later was taken to Southampton for a ship back to India, leaving the children inconsolable for the loss of their ayah. In fact, memoirs reveal how children regarded their ayahs who had brought them up. The company court directories for 1960, sorry, 1690, 1702 contained several applications from the company employees to return, to return the Indian servants and ayahs in company ships. Then there were the advertisements 
in the 17th and 18th century newspapers. At the time, these were not available electronically as today. It was a question of plowing through microfilms of burning papers for hours to locate an advertisement by an Indian servant, Uriah. For instance, in 1795, a talented ayah from Bengal who had lived with her mistress as a servant to a family going to, to Bengal, where she lived two years and was now in Britain. She was with this mistress for 10 years, two in Bengal, eight in England, and one year in France. I won't read it out because it's up there. Another Bengali ayah wishing to return under the protection of any lady going to India was willing to attend without wages as she was desperate for a passage back to India. Probably she was homesick. And yet another was ready to serve as a servant to a lady in return for a passage to Bengal. Why bring ayahs to Britain? A letter in the public advertiser dated 2nd December 1786 from a correspondent who signed, him, signed himself Truth provides a clue. Again, it's up there, so I won't read it. <laughs> and since not families provided a return passage for the ayahs, leaving them to fend for themselves, I began to wonder what happened to these stranded ayahs? And where did they find lodgings and for how much? R. M. Hughes, the secretary to the stranger's home in Limehouse, provided one answer. According to him, in one lodging house, one lodging house keeper told him that there were no less than 32 ayahs in her house. While Salter, the missionary to the Asians and Africans at the stranger's home in Limehouse, has left a description. And I will read this one out because I think it's very interesting. At one house, I found 28 ayahs. It is by no means unusual to find men also lodging here. In fact, the house in question has never been free of them. It is also low order. The boxes of the ayahs generally form their bedstead. And they were all placed close together to prevent them rolling out. The parlor with the shop front has lost its door but its absence is supplied by a screen. There is a door out of this room into the back in which a man who is fugitive from India sleeps. There have been windows in the door, but they have been broken during the drunken riots of the ayahs. As far as I can discover, about 140 have been located at these places at 16 shillings weekly during the past year. So if people think, Indian women are no side. <laughs> <laughs> Salter obviously did not rank this lodging house highly. Were there other better ones? And where? And then I had a stroke of luck. I had been looking to some documents about Indian settlers in the East End in the Tower Hamlet archives. A pile of books were also waiting for me. By late afternoon, I was quite tired. But still, I decided to tackle the books. And, through and coming through a copy of George R. Sims, Living London, published in 1906, Volume 3, in the chapter entitled Missionary London by Eric Robertson on page 279, I chanced across a photograph showing Asian women in the Ayah's home, Hackney, a photograph which, which now, by now has become quite famous. One is over there, one is back there. <laughs> and on page 281, there was a description of the work of the city mission among London's foreign population. The article went on to say that Hackney, the city mission has its ayah's home, a great boon to the Indian women who can come and go between here and India as nurses or attendants or ladies and their children. A eureka moment for me, because research tends to be very hard. <laughs> the photograph opened up a further line of research at Hackney Archives and the London City Mission to find more information on the whereabouts of the Ayah's home in Hackney and the date of its founding. David Minder, the archivist at Hackney, told me that the archive had no information, though later he kindly sent me a splendid photograph 
dated 1910, showing them Indian women standing outside the house. Then it also helpfully suggested that I look at Kelly's Hackney and Hoverton Street directories. I began about 1890, not knowing where to start, you see. For the year 1894-95, 26 King Edward Road was first mentioned, showing an entry for the Hackney Catholic High School for girls with Miss L. Watkins as the head. There was no entry for 26 King Edward Road both for 1895-96 and 97-97. <coughs> then for the year 1902-1903, I found Aya's home listed at number 26 King Edward Road where we were this afternoon, and Mrs. Rogers as the matron. From 1905 to 1906 onwards, till 1918, Mrs. Dunn was named as the matron. In 1919, Mrs. Fletcher takes over. Later, I would find Mrs. Dunn's interview in the 1910 report from the Committee on Distressed Colonial and Indian Subjects at the British Library, providing a good deal of information about its funding and how the home operated. <coughs> My next visit was, of course, to the London City Mission at 175 Tower Bridge Road. Interestingly, I used to see the building from the train on my way to Charing Cross. Unfortunately, I was not given access to minutes, etc. But I was directed to copies of the London City Mission magazine. These form of a major source of information for the IAS home at 26 King Edward Road. And as I said, there are tons and tons of it if you want to do your research. And there is relocation of larger premises at Forking and Madrone. Both buildings bore the name Ayers Home in bold letters on the door. Nowadays, there is nothing there to show you what they were. <coughs> the first lodging for the Ayers was set up in Duke Street by Mrs. Rogers. After her death, Mr. and Mrs. Hanson took over the property in 1867. They made much of it as a home for Indian Ayers. Later, when the council took over Duke Street properties for renovation in 1987, the Hansons, still trading under the name of Rogers, moved to 6 <coughs> Jewelry Street. And in 1897, the London City Mission took over the running of the Ayers home. The LCM magazine for December 1921, volume 86, a page 141 to 143, provides the history of the origin of the institution, its, re its relocation to a larger building at number four, which was originally a merchant house, incidentally. And as in the opinion of the city mission, Jewelry Street was not salubrious enough as a home for Indian women. With great fanfare, the article describes its opening by ex Viserine of India by Countess Chelford. The building at number four had 30 rooms and is described as the home of the nations. In rooms which were ticketed as Javanese, Malay states, Indians, Chinese, Siamese, Japanese, that is, rooms allocated according to nationality and ethnicity. Every year, depending on the traveling season, March to October, around 100 ayahs stayed at the home. The home provided accommodation for ayahs and Chinese amas, sent there by white British families. The ayahs stayed for free, as their return ticket, normally provided by the family who had brought them, was sold to the matron, to another family needing an ayah. The money obtained paid for the ayahs boarding and lodging, 14 shillings a week. Any shortfall was made up by donations. In time, a sophisticated network equal to a modern day employment agency had formed around the Ayers home. But the Ayers home was more than a hostel. The chief objective was to, to bring the Ayers under Christian influence. In the absence of any data, it is impossible to measure the success of the evangelical zeal. The magazine provides growing, glowing accounts of the warmth, the comfort of Indian food provided, and conversations in ethnic languages, because the matrons had 
worked in India so they could speak various Indian dialects. Certainly, it improved the quality of this tale, but a word of caution. The magazines were a propaganda tool in need to raise money, you see. The home represented a colonial enclave, a symbol of empire replicating colonial attitudes, stereotypical images in the, of the other, a language that makes you cringe. Florian will be talking more about this. At the height of the Second World War, with few families traveling, the home closed in 1941. Research can be a struggle and hard work, but sometimes one has lucky breaks and unexpected finds. And this is exactly how I discovered the Ayas home, leading me on to further research and sources of information. By now, of course, academics in Britain, Australia, India, and the USA are all adding to our knowledge. Finally, I would like to end with my thanks to Farhana for campaigning for the plaque which was unveiled this afternoon. And as a one-time teacher, I would stress this is not immigrant history, but it is British history for all. And this is why it's very nice now to see the plaque there. Thank you, Farhana. that's really important to say is that um, my research on Ayas and Laskas very much stands in an intertwined relationship with um, Rosina's work and we've been working together for over a decade now um, and um, it's been really a, a great privilege for me to continue this and one I think one of the key things that I've that I've learned from Rosina particularly when working with these materials is how to read the archive against the grain particularly in when we are faced with um, materials where we don't, are unable to access um, original voices. The, the voices of the eyes are very much buried. So finding ways of reading the archive against the grain, I think, is a really um, important thing to, to think about when looking at these kinds of, um, of sources. And I guess many of us could really not have done um, our work without um, Rosina's meticulous pioneering archival research, which for so many is an important starting point. Um, and initial access to commence our own archival journeys as we delve into often intimidatingly large amounts of materials. Um, Penny Brook reliably tells me that the collections of the India Office records alone are nine miles of archive, so <laughs> a lot to discover there. As Rosina has already mentioned, writers, painters and photographers were fascinated by the figure of the Aya, the way in which um, Ayas have been represented in the 18th, 19th, and early 20th century gives us an insight into the ideologies of empire, master-servant relationships, but also how through art, culture, and pictorial representation, a particular image of the Ayah began to take hold in the wider public imagination. This fascination with the Oriental and the exotic, a fantasy conveniently peddled in wider media and cultural representations of the time, also became useful for the managers of the Ayas home, first as an independent entity, 
and later taken over by the Foreigners Branch of the London City Mission. And to explore this further, I want to focus on a few pictorial and literary representations to further animate this. Rosina has already mentioned, of course, um, this um, quotation from Charles Dickens' in State in Copperfield, um, which is serialized in 1849-50 and then um, published in novel form in 1850, where we're um, introduced here to um, the returning figure of um, of, Sarah Mill, of Julia Mill, sorry, with, um, with her Scottish husband, who at that moment is in London. And Dickens very much offers us a stereotypical point of view of descriptions, almost the kind of caricatures that we're getting here. Um, as the narrator rhetoric starts off with his rhetorical question and then with his descriptions. We see here David Copperfield's keen observing eye making his valued judgments of Julia Mills and her rich husband and also showing himself cognizant of her Indian domestic workers, her servants and ayahs, highlighting her newly acquired status. The ironic description of her husband and his flaps of ears, too, don't go unnoticed. We register here, then, a silent presence of these domestic workers, the generation of wealth um, through their exploitative work in India, <coughs> back into the environs of England. And it's interesting to see, then, how these relationships of power are represented during the, uh, the period of high imperialism that follows. Again, I'm going to take us back to the painting going north, now housed at the Railway Museum in York, which features centrally in the painting an Aya reassuring her charge as she ties a bright red coat around her. In the hustle and bustle of the business on the platform, we see the little girl's face turned towards the artist, or the viewer even. Her red cape draws attention to her, but also to her caregiving Aya as well. I think it's really, really um, important to think about the centrality um, of that within the painting and how it contrasts also with other um, elements of red in that painting. In the 1910 booklet, The London City Mission Among All Nations, which features an image of the matron, Mrs. Dunn, um, with a group of eyes at the foreigner's fate, the eyes home then located at 26 King Edward Road, is written up as follows. And I quote here, this institution of, under the superintendent of its able matron has been an untold boon to these interesting visitors who come and go on board the Indian liners. Were it not for the home and the haven it is, it would be difficult to say how the many dangers of London, near the docks in particular, could be evaded. The reference here to eyes as interesting visitors already creates an image of them as not belonging, but also very much presents the docks as a location of vice and danger from which these women had to be protected and saved. It then goes on to quote at length a reporter from an unspecified London Daily newspaper who describes the home as an environment full of warmth and color um, of the Orient and entering it an enviable <coughs> experience. We also get a glimpse here of the house itself described as a spacious three-storied 16-roomed house in Hackney to house what he describes as the ever-changing colony of ayahs who, having left India with their mistresses and finding their services no longer required, seek there a temporary home until a return to their warmer clime is, um, is found practicable, practicable. We see here a particularly interesting centering of the work of the home and the euphemistic description of some of the difficult positions some ayahs found themselves in. It's clear that the article is designed to generate wider public interest and the London City Mission employs a certain rhetoric in view of garnering financial support. This booklet was published not soon after the London City Mission had taken over the running of the home. The journalist goes on in this description as follows. On the warm summer days, the women preambulate the adjacent Victoria Park, dressed in the gaze of attire, the high-pitched voices being discernible a great distance away. Many an ayah has so endeared herself to the family as to make it, to make it low part to, to part with her, but the call of the East is insistent, and these Indian women hail the prospect of their ultimate return home with every manifestation of gladness. So again, there is a certain kind of framing and a certain you know, kind of rhetoric that comes into play here. And it's here where the pressure ends its extensive quotation from the journalist and extends an open invitation for visitors to the ayah's home to see the home and its inmates followed by a plea for further subscription and financial 
assistance. These materials have, of course, another dimension here. It is also important to consider the home very much as a commercial enterprise. It's indicated by the business card. In that respect, it's important to note that it serves like an employment exchange for British families <coughs> making the voyage to India and returning families from the subcontinent to Britain. But the journalist's observations delineate clearly the fascination that I has held in the public imagination as an emblem of an imaginary imperial colonial exotic and its manifestation and embodiment in the figure of the Ayah at the centre of empire in the city of London. As Rosina has indicated in her talk, the Ayahs were integral to British family life, both in India and in Britain, and as such it cannot be stressed enough that they are part of British history, and so it is gratifying to see that on 26 King Edward Road, this is commemorated now through the blue plaque there for to see. All the time, the Ayahs home, a name building in the heart of the imperial metropolis, bears this out too. Yet it also should not go unnoticed that beyond the publicity materials and the post images lies a much more complex and sinister story of the lived experience of the Ayah. The images make clear that the Ayah's home, in a similar vein to the strangest home for Asiatics, Africans, and South Sea Islanders, also run by the London City Mission with Joseph Salter as resident missionary, was a colonial enclave, and the way in which the Ayah's home and its residents were represented reveal many colonial attitudes and stereotypes. In these images, the Ayahs are, for example, never referred to by name, but merely as an Ayah or a group of Ayahs as seen in the photos. And this is actually one of the um, more recent find finds in the, um, in the Getty archives, um, which um, is, I, I think, is an, is an extraordinary image, particularly with, as it very much centers the eye and the eyes looking into um, the, the camera almost with an air of amusement as they're um, having um, a song played to them. The caption kind of tries to reveal something slightly different there, but um, I think there is a real agency in that photograph that is perhaps not seen so much in, in other images. Some of the surviving passports um, of the IS2 are actually a really important source, and many of these are, whole, um, are, are, are held in the India Office Records um, collections because it gives us more of an indication of, um, of their names, and particularly the names of traveling ayahs. Um, but they are often again referred to as Anthony Ayah, Mary Ayah, Ruth Ayah, Jessica Ayah, or sometimes by an Indian name, Halima Ayah, um, as well. So in some way, the supervisors of the ayahs' home um, very much infantilized them, treating them like school children with their programs of instruction. To contemporaries, ayahs were described often as childlike or as children of other clients. And at the Ayah's home, they were shepherded before visiting dignitaries to sing hymns, talk to them by the matron. Um, for example, at the Foreigners' Fate in 1904, they were conducted to sing from Greenland's icy mountains. Okay, what a choice. There we are. The Ayah's home then represented um, an expression of Christian charity and welfare that relied on an image of the so described poor Ayah. And this was built around the prevalent concept and ideology of the time which sought to represent an image of the caring mother country with the colonized ayahs expressing their gratitude, loyalty, and appreciation of kindness shown them by the home. Since there were little reports of ayahs giving any trouble, the India office responsible for Indians in Britain saw no need for any investigation into their contracts of labor, their wages, their working conditions, or any need for reform, despite their knowledge um, of examples of callous and indifferent employers who discarded them on arrival in Britain. It only interceded on rare occasions and only offered limited financial, um, uh, financial support um, to, to the home. For the public, on the other hand, the ayahs were fascinating. Their faces, nose rings, bangles, voices, and their clothes so fascinated them that ayahs were stared at and photographed many times. Helen Allingham, a 19th century painter, who came across an English woman not long returned from India with an ayah and her child at a seaside resort not far from Dover, was so intrigued that it inspired several of her paintings replicating the image of the same ayah in different settings. It is hard to get an insight um, what the ayahs themselves thought about this. We have not as yet come across any direct accounts of ayahs that open up their perspective 
on their experiences. Similarly, we can only speculate as to what motivated them to travel their families to Britain. Reasons may range from economic necessity to their devotion to their charges as the maternal bond had developed over such a long time. But perhaps there is also a spirit of adventure or the desire to see the country of their rulers. One thing needs to be made clear though, Ayers were not childlike as the colonial imagery and imperial rhetoric of the time would like us to believe. They were resilient, responsible women able to negotiate their way around India and Britain. So I'm going to return us back to this image from 1938. The Ayers have a long history in Britain, but as working class women, they themselves have left no history of their own behind, and have also easily slipped through official records. And there is also a persistent issue in how histories of domestic labour are underappreciated. As women, they have for far too long been regarded as unimportant and not having played a vital role, and so their role in colonial and British history has remained unacknowledged. And this makes the blue plaque to commemorate these women all the more important. There is also a further dimension for us to consider, and that is how the history of working lives and of ordinary people is recorded and brought to wider public attention. The Ayas are part of pioneering groups of Indian women of different strata in society. Their significant contribution to British life find traces in the archives, but more needs to be done to bring their stories to wider public attention. So I hope um, in these kinds of talks on the Blue Plug are um, an important part to um, elicit more quick curiosity into that. Thank you. the Ayers homes here. So I'm talking about arriving, transitioning, and the uncertainty involved in that process. And I'm doing this as an expert on diversity at sea, particularly in relation to women. So Ayers were very important as rare women travellers. Women were not travelling much at all, whatever their background. And Ayers were exceptionally the first brown female business travels when very few people were leaving home. The reason that women didn't travel was because they didn't have the money, uh, because it was thought unsuitable for people who were brown or female to do all that much moving. And also the belief for some people, they thought that they would lose, for some ayahs, they thought they would lose caste if they crossed the sea. So what we know, and the figures are really dodgy, is that between 1890 and 1960, there were 984 Ayer voyages to England. So some of these were Ayers coming several times. It's not that there were 984 Ayers, but that there were 984 voyages and 308 Ayers leaving the UK, which suggests that quite a lot stayed here, but they settled. Um, so Ayers were this extraordinary thing on ships. They were worker passengers. Uh, like valets and butlers who were just there because the employee, the, pass the employer, sorry, the passenger needed them. Why, why would anybody employ an ayah? Well, first of all, because of custom at that time, particularly in the 1900s, it was thought that um, a ship was no place for noisy, playful children who disturbed people's rest and repose as they gazed at the ocean. And also, it was well recognised, and you probably know this today from trips on planes, particularly long trips, but mums need support, and in particular they needed support on long risky voyages. There were two sorts of ayahs. The, the smaller number were what you might call professional baby couriers. These were women who were employed just to do the trip to and from, and they were frequent sailors like the Lascar Indian crew. By contrast, the majority of Ayers were embedded family members. They were already working for the family that was traveling to England. And of course they went to, to help out. The difference between Ayers and Laskers is that Ayers were domestic workers who were privately employed making one-off trips and they were solo figures. Whereas Laskers were employees of companies. They were doing manual dirty work involved with the vessel the ship itself, and they were there en masse, they were teams, they had company. 
So let's just think about what a voyage was like in Elia's life. She'd be in India for two days doing the preparation, traveling from wherever she was in the country to the docks. And of course, this would be prefaced by months of preparation, including saying farewell to her own family. And then there'd be the 30 day voyage, roughly, around about 1920, a period of somewhat calm, but in transit. And then at the other end, Kapow, to at least two days of settling into the UK, this grey foreign place, and then whatever went on for her next, which we'll talk about in a minute. So stage one was leaving India. This is a picture of Ballard Pier, uh, which was built in 1934. So you can see it's a situation of um, bags and bustle and people feeling nonplussed. Then stage two, on the ship itself, it's important to think about the ship as all sorts of complicated things like a grand house or a very posh coach, like a floating lorry because there was cargo on board, as wonderful as spacecraft are to us today. A ship was a thing you wanted to be on and you boasted about being on. And it was also a peculiar, exceptional offshore space, a bit like Alice's Wonderland. And it was a place in between A and B. It was that funny stage of I'm not anywhere quite at the moment. And it was a very hierarchical situation. Class, colour and gender all mattered and would have affected an ayah a lot. Um, so what made ayah's voyages vary? Partly it was the ship, as you see, including the seaworthiness of the vessel and how sick they were. And um, also it was about ship shipmates. So if your employer was lovely and the kids were good, it was bearable. And also if there were other hours on board who you got on with and there could be between um, two and eight or eight, one or eight hours on board a ship. Uh, you, obviously you had the company and if you liked her that would be great. It would be good to offload together and walk the decks together. So stage three was the arrival in the UK. They uh, went to lots of docks, including Tilbury mainly, but also Southampton, Liverpool and Plymouth. This is a 1903 picture. So remember, they were arriving after four weeks of doing care and domestic work nonstop, doing a lot of emotional labour, looking after their Nemsarp and the kids. A period of being hyper vigilant because, of course, you were worried that the kids would fall overboard. Um, very unprivate. You were really under surveillance and you were cooped up with your boss. You didn't have space to go to where you were just being yourself relaxed. So then when the eye moved from the ship to the eye's home, if that's where she was going to, this is what was happening in the period about 1910 to 1940. She'd be disembarking, very tired of all the movement and very glad to settle. There'd be bedlam on the docks. She'd be inspected and so would her luggage, like going through customs at an airport today. She'd be severing from the children who she might well love because she'd looked after them for, um, well, since they were babies or a long time. And also, um, because employers didn't necessarily behave well, the eye might get the shocking news uh, that there'd been gaslighting about her contract and she wasn't going to be as looked after in England as she had expected. And then she'd be getting the train, the 25 miles from, say, Tilbury to Liverpool Street Terminus, and then the extra about 30 minutes to Hackney Down Station, and then about a 30 minute walk to the Ayers home. Stage four, when she was in this home from home, the Ayers home, there were four homes. They continued from about 1825 to 1940. Two were in Allgate and then two were later in Hackney. Increasingly, they were in a Christian situation run by the London City Mission. It was no longer a commercial boarding house that they were staying in. And we don't know how many Ayers there were. Most of the stats I've seen show about four to five ayahs at any one time, but it's claimed that we're about 90 to 100 there a year. So here's a picture at 26 King Edward Road, around about 1900. 
and here are some pictures of the sites of the two first Ayers homes. One was at H Duke Street, long gone now in all this fancy city development. Um, sorry, that should say 1825, not 1925, to about 1890. And then uh, the second home, which was open more briefly, but was a continuation, was at 6 Jewelry Street, 1891-ish to 1899-ish. And that's what the area where the house was looks like today. Uh, then the third Ayers home opened 1900 to 1921-ish at 26 King Edward Road. That's what it looks like today, as you probably know. And then the fourth one was up for King Edward Road in Hackney from 1921 to 1940. So you're probably very familiar with that picture on the steps um, in the early days. And then we've got the picture of the very posh building it is today. Not an nice home. Now, one of the key things about the Ayers home was that the Ayers may have had to wait there for a long time. Uh, Ayers, people, Ayers and people travelling to India travelled to avoid the monsoon season, so they were travelling from, from November to January. So what I've done is I've browned out the period where the Ayers might have to be staying in England, waiting to get a voyage back to India. So you can see there's only really three months when they'd be travelling a lot. I've traced four women who stayed at the home. I've traced them via the passenger list that are available and census information from Ancestry.com and so on. Uh, so I've actually connected the voyage and the home. And these are four people I found. In 1922, an ayah called Moraine B. Ayer, who came from Iraq to Plymouth. In 1939, Ayer Rebakal, who was looking after six-year-old Miss Sims. In 1939, Donna Padrihami Malaratiji, she was travelling from Colombo to Plymouth and she was looking after two boys, John and Michael Meekins. As you see, Michael was only a baby, so it must have been quite a difficult voyage for her. And then in 1939 again, a Chinese woman, Mrs. Or Yang Tang, came and we don't know who she was looking after, nor do we know how long they stayed in the home. But this is a picture of the women who came here. And it, it gives us a glimpse of how the home was used. If you want to learn more, you can look at my website. There's a section on Ayers on board. I'd be very happy to talk with you and I'd love to hear from people who had Ayers themselves. Thank you for listening. Do join in and share the information that you have. Thank you. Hello, my name is Claire Lowry and I'm giving a presentation on the Chinese Amars that came to the Hackney Ayers home. And this paper is co-authored with Victoria Haskins. I'm presenting from Wollongong, uh, which is about an hour and a half drive southeast, south of Sydney, and it's on the lands of the Darawal people. So I want to acknowledge, acknowledge uh, the Indigenous traditional owners of this land. So I'm a long way from Hackney, and my interest in the Hackney Ayers and Amas home is related to a current project that I'm involved in. And that project is exploring the history of traveling ayahs and amahs of the British Empire. So women who traveled for work with their employers um, and especially women who traveled from, uh, in my case, the fo I'm focused on women who traveled from Malaya and Hong Kong to Australia and Britain. So that's my focus. And this project is led by Victoria Haskins. It started in 2020, but we're still early on in the project due to the kind of um, pandemic really and the hold that it's put on our research. And I'm really looking forward to coming to the UK next year and doing some, some additional archival research for the project. But I'd also really love to hear from you if you have stories of Chinese Amars in Britain, 
um, that you'd like to share. So you can find my email address here if that's part of your family history or you just know of leads that I should follow up on. Okay, so what we know in terms of the Hackney Ayers home focuses primarily on Ayers in the home. So leading on from the work of Rosina Vishram, a number of historians have looked in detail at Indian Ayers in the home and they've told that story in the context of the kind of broader forces of colonialism and migration and the history of gender and of um, labour relations as well. So some of the historians that are on this little mini bibliography are part of the panel today, and I'm very honored to be presenting alongside them. There's still a great deal that we don't know about Indian Ayers in Hackney, Ayers and Amar's home. And it's really exciting that new work is constantly emerging on that topic. But if we don't know all, the, all that much about Ayers, we know even less when it comes to Chinese Amar's in the home. So this existing literature has acknowledged that in Chinese Amas were also coming into Britain and that some of them ended up in the Ayers home in Hackney. And we know as well from images of the home such as this one, that Chinese Amas were indeed present in that home. But that's about all we know. The historical literature concerning Amas in uh, Malaya and Hong Kong barely acknowledges the role of these women in traveling with children as part of the job. So I've come across so far only a really tiny um, reference at the end of Kenneth Gore's pioneering book that talks about a Chinese ama coming to Britain as part of her job. So I guess I'm trying to recover this forgotten story of Chinese amas traveling as part of their work. And there are a number of avenues that I'm pursuing in trying to recover that story. One really useful place to look is the incoming and outgoing passenger lists from Britain, uh, for Britain and Ireland, or for the United Kingdom and Ireland. And a look at that list, which can be found on Ancestry, shows that around about 258 women came in as Amars. Um, from the period uh, from 1878 to 1960, so quite small figures, and far fewer than the numbers of Ayers coming into Britain. So Joe Stanley, for example, who's also worked with this data, um, estimates that around 900 Ayers came in based on these list, lists. So certainly more Ayers and Amas, but we should treat these figures cautiously. They don't take into account, for example, Chinese Amas who are coming in but were listed as servant or nursemaid. So I need to drill down further into the data to get more accuracy. But they give us a bit of an indication. And they tell us that Amas were coming in from about 1891, but the bulk came in during the 20th century. And here you'll see the peak in 1919, which is quite an interesting peak, 25 women in one year and 18 of those women came in aboard the same ship. These were the Amas of the SS Marama or more accurately AT, Ambulance Transport Marama, that brought back British women and children from Malaya at the conclusion of the First World War and Amas came along with them. This is a really interesting story. And if you'd like to know more about it, you might want to join the National Maritime Museum talk on the 21st of June, where I'll be going into some more detail with some of the panelists involved in this event as well. One other thing to note is how Amars are listed on this record, on these records. So they're listed by the surname of their employers rather than their own names. And that, um, as you can imagine, makes it incredibly difficult to trace them. But what we do know from this data is that Chinese Amars were coming to the UK and Ireland primarily from Hong Kong, from Malaya, including the Strait Settlements and the Federated Malay States in particular, and from the treaty ports of China. They included women who stayed for less than a year and some who stayed for several years. And we know that because of the other kinds of materials that we're working with in this project. So for example, the University of Bristol's Historical Photographs of China collection includes records, photographs and memoir material from the Johnson family who returned from England to England from Shanghai in 1935 and brought along their armor with them. 
Her name isn't recorded in that material, but it indicates that she stayed in England for around 10 years. <clears throat> We've just begun the process as well of collecting oral histories. And again, that confirms the presence of Chinese Amars in Britain sometimes for several years. So the Gladstone family, for example, returned to Britain from Singapore um, in the early 1960s, and they brought along with them their Amar, sorry, their Amar, Amar called Hyong in that period. And she stayed with the family for a few years before moving on and getting another job with another employer in London after that. So that's a bit of a potted history of Amars in Britain, but what about Amars in the Hackney home in particular? In this presentation, I'm drawing on material from the archives of the London City Mission who ran the home and their, the London City Mission magazine as well to bring to light these kinds of stories. And that material was collected by Victoria Haskins back in 2013. And she's used some of that material to create a two part blog that some of you might be interested in looking at and you can find it via our project website. What this material shows is that Chinese Amars were um, coming to the home from very early on. So the first mention we found is from 1860 when an ama who's named in the records as Sing Sung was recorded as coming to the home from the treaty port of Ningbo. It's not until the 1920s that amas are a, a very regular presence in the home and that they're coming in, in decent numbers, so dozens by this point. And they continue coming in into the 1930s as well. And it's in this period by around the mid 1920s that the home starts to be referred to not just as the home for Ayers, but as the Ayers and Amar's home or as the home of nations, reflecting that kind of composition change. So just to give you a little bit of sense of numbers. So by 1924, there's 32 Chinese Amar's in the home that use the home in that year rather than kind of one or two. By the 1930s, it's dropped off a little bit, 25 Amars in 1937. But what's significant is that they're outnumbering Ayers in that year, only 18 Indian Ayers in that year. The other significant um, aspect to acknowledge is that the numbers of Chinese Amars using the Hackney Ayers home is peaking in a period when the numbers of Ayers coming into the country or into the countries is in decline. So here I've organised the passenger arrival information by decade, and you can clearly see that drop off in the 20s and 30s. So why is it that Amars are coming to the home in increasing numbers in this period, a time when their numbers overall in Britain is in decline? To answer that question, we need to delve into the reasons for why they used this home. Um, and that can be tricky to answer because we don't have first-hand accounts from the women themselves and we need to rely on the London City Mission records in order to pose and answer those questions. They do have individual stories of some of the women in there and that helps to paint a bit of a picture of why they were coming to the UK and using the home in particular. So women such as Lois Wu, who'd been working as an ama in England for a number of years, but found herself without a job and needed a way of getting home to Shanghai. Another ama from Shanghai uh, called Wu Wanzi was a regular visitor to the home and had traveled numerous times between the UK and China, excuse me. So she was a professional traveling ama. She did this for her job. And these kinds of stories um, reflect as well why Indian women were using the home for similar reasons. Either they got stuck or um, this was their profession and the home was a nice little handy stopping off point. But there were also really specific reasons for why Chinese Amas were using the home in the 20s and 30s. And this is something that I'm only just starting to think about now. Why in this period is there an increase? So I'm hypothesizing a little at this point and I need to do some more research, but I'm starting the process. And I think there's really three key reasons for this. The first one is a sense of solidarity or the collective nature of Amas as an occupationary group in this period. 
So by the 20s and 30s, many of the Amas coming into the UK um, would have been Maji. So these Amas were members of sworn sisterhood groups that had uh, originated in China, had a history of radical marriage resistance um, and supported each, the, the women in these groups supported each other. They had a really distinctive uniform of the white shirt and the black pants that you can see in this image here. And in Malaya and Hong Kong, these sisterhood organizations organized recruitment, protected women to the degree they could from exploitative employers and provided financial support, for example, in retirement. I think perhaps the fact that these women were so kind of well organized in such a cohesive group of workers may have facilitated a situation where they're stuck together in Britain as well. Um, everyone ended up in this home. Um, so that's why it happened. That's one possible reason. What I have more evidence for is that superintendents and staff of the home were helping the Amars navigate the requirements of immigration, um, in particular the aliens ordinance that came into force in 1920 as a means of limiting the numbers of immigrants coming into Britain in the context of widespread unemployment. So so-called aliens from non-British colonies had to register with police, but even those from British colonies um, like Hong Kong and Malaya had to have a valid British passport, valid British visa, sorry, and had to have proof that they were returning to their colony. So the London City Mission records managing the paperwork involved for the women. And I think that would have been a really big draw card. The final reason is what was going on in China and Southeast Asia and East Asia during this period. Um, so the revolution or the civil war in, in China in 1927 between the communists and the nationalists made for really unstable conditions. And then the Sino-Japanese war beginning in 1937 meant that women uh, were this home was in greater demand for women who didn't want to return to the East. And according to the minute books of the London City Mission, um, they had to begin limiting the amount of time Chinese Amars in particular could stay in the home. So they used to be able to stay until they got a return voyage home. They stopped that and put a limit on it. And they also imposed a weekly fee for those women rather than having to pay just a one-off fee um, at the beginning, and they explained the need to do that was due to the increased demand of Chinese women um, to stay indefinitely at the home. I want to end my presentation now with a short reflection on what life in the home was like for Chinese Amas, just to give a bit of a sense. So rooms, as um, most of you probably know, were separated according to ethnicity. And there's evidence to suggest that those running the home did so with a sense of um, racial hierarchy in mind. So for example, Mr. Fletcher, the superintendent, maintained that Chinese Amas were more diligent than Indian Ayas. And this kind of racialized refrain is one you see commonly in the records. Even so, there were opportunities for these women to connect across cultural and linguistic lines. So for example, they were photographed together on excursions to the zoo, for example, and visitors to the home recorded that the women in groups, women generally from the East in groups, socializing together, knitting and singing in the garden. Another key feature of life in the Ayas and Amas home was of course the attempts of the missionaries to convert the women to Christianity. As one article in the London City Mission magazine put it, we teach these women portions of the word of God and send them back to India and China singing the glad tidings of redemption and love. And they include account, account after account of Chinese women successfully converted to Christianity. But they also include accounts of women um, who weren't so successfully converted and what comes across is their frustration with this situation. So for example, one unnamed Chinese woman who declares herself a Christian as they put it, but whose outlook is definitely pagan. Her goal in working as a traveling ama and coming to the home was to accrue enough savings to build what she termed a temple in which she could retire when she was too old to work. And from their perspective, that showed that she hadn't really taken on Christian values at all. 
And cases such as this, I think, highlight the degree of agency and autonomy of the Chinese Amars who made use of the Hackney Ayers and Amars home. It shows that they did so for their own purposes and on their own terms. And that's the kind of theme that I'd like to conclude on. Thank you very much. Century. Um, the Aya's uh, ideological position changed. Her, there, was a, there was a shift because she initially uh, was seen as a moral embarrassment because uh, there was almost uh, this uh, lack of differentiation. Is she uh, a concubine? Is she a mistress to a British um, uh, man? Because they were coming to India, the, the, the British men, and marrying Indian women. And some of them were also their ayahs, uh, the, the ayahs working in the house and domestic workers. So in the 19th century, the ayah's role and ideological position started to change. She was seen as a waged earner and no longer uh, a slave or a concubine or somewhere in that ambiguous zone. She was now a waged earner and she was then slowly glorified and, and her, her loyalty, her devotion, etc. was given huge emphasis especially after the 1857 mutiny uh, where, uh, you know, uh, the Indian subjects rebelled uh, against the British, but the Ayas uh, were seen as the most loyal um, subjects, protecting the children, hiding the British families in their homes. So really after the 1857 mutiny, the Aya was really glorified and seen as someone very loyal. Now it's Rosina's pioneering work which tells us the lived experience that the Ayas were actually in reality facing precarity, abandonment, exploitation. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, in the, under the British Empire and in India, they were also very glorified. There were portraits of Ayas, there were letters being sent uh, by their employers glorifying the Ayas role, etc. So, what happened to this celebrated Ayas system after 1947 when India achieved independence? Um, Joel's passenger lists show that after 1953, there were no voyages with Ayas going to Britain. And that's when I started as an anthropologist. Uh, thinking, well, what happened to this Aya system? Did they, did this colonial network, did they migrate en masse with their British employers and their Anglo-Indian employers? I don't think so. There was no evidence to suggest that. And then, uh, theoretically, um, I found that historians were only working on the colonial period and us anthropologists were only working on the contemporary period. So. Uh, there, was, there was no kind of dialogue here and I started researching, taking my cues from history and what the historical past teaches us. And I found, uh, and I'm giving away all my findings before I've even written the book, so keep them in this, in this room please. Um, but I found that um, after 1947, um, there was this migration taking place within India where ayahs and domestic servants who had worked with British families were migrating from these railway colonies in Madras, Bangalore, Kolar gold fields to uh, diplomatic missions, international homes in New Delhi, which had become the capital, uh, because they were English, uh, they were Christian converts. They could speak English. They had experience of serving Westerners. Uh, they could lay tables, uh, arrange parties, uh, they were still referred to as bearers, they could make apple, apple pie, plum pudding, etc, uh, etc. Et and they started getting these jobs in uh, international homes, diplomatic missions in the 1970s uh, and 80s. And then came liberalization where India opened up its isolated economy and I found from that period onwards, uh, the Aya was constantly being referred to uh, in reference letters, job adverts, as we need 
uh, we're looking for an all-rounder. We're looking for an all-rounder ayah. So now the contemporary ayah is an all-rounder with a very diverse skill set. Uh, she must have certified training, she must have very strong culinary knowledge, she must have transnational experience, many of them have university degrees, prior work experience in offices. So the role of the ayah has, has changed to not this large retinue, uh, uh, this large workforce in the British household and the Indian elite which involved uh, several domestic workers and one uh, female ayah. The ayah must also be an excellent cook. She must know how to manage uh, a, a, you know, a broken fridge, uh, all those things, change nappies at the same time. So um, the, the, the role has definitely changed, uh, but yet the performance of unconditional love and munificent care provided by Indian ayahs is taken for granted as a continuity from colonial experiences and memories of empire. So ayahs continue to embody in their all-round role sentiments of faithfulness and devotion and these dominant constructions are very much alive. Thank you very much. Count in Hindi. Eight, two, three.